from Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 18, recorded on September 28, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. And today I'd like to take a closer look at Paul's column, an RSV vaccine during pregnancy. So maybe we could start, Paul, by having you describe RSV and babies. What's it all about? Right. So respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, is probably the most important pathogen in the winter for causing children to be hospitalized. So the virus can affect the upper respiratory tract um, and the, the windpipe causing croup. It can infect the small breathing tubes causing bronchiolitis and wheezing. It can infect the lungs causing pneumonia. And every year, about 80,000 children in this country are hospitalized with RSV. Um, most of those children are previously healthy. About 80% of those children are previously healthy, so therefore anybody's at risk. And there's 100 to 300 deaths a year. The thing is, though, it's primarily not only in infants, it's, it's in very young infants. So it's primarily really in the less than three-month-old, which is too young for an active immunization program to work. The only kind of program that would work there would be passive immunization, either by giving mm. a long-acting monoclonal antibody like nirsevimab or Bayfortis, which we've discussed uh, previously on, um, on these uh, posts, or by immunizing the mother and then having uh, the mother induce an immune response to the mother, which is then passively transferred uh, to the baby transplacentally, which will then protect that baby for the first roughly four to six months of life, which is what we're going to talk about today. So recently, the CDC approved a third trimester RSV vaccine for mothers. Tell us how that works. Right. So, so um, two companies worked on this vaccine. They both made the vaccine the same way. Um, the, the, the product that was approved by the, um, the, that was licensed by the Food and Drug Administration and just on September 22nd of 2023 then was uh, recommended for uh, use in pregnant uh, women was the uh, Pfizer's vaccine. So, so the way they did that study which was about a 7,000-person placebo-controlled study, one-to-one -one vaccine to placebo, um, they gave 120 micrograms of this pre-fusion protein unadjuvanted to people between 24 and 36 weeks gestation um, and found that the vaccine was effective, was about this sort of 70 to 80 percent effective at preventing uh, severe respiratory syncytial virus infection. And so that's why it got licensed. Now, interestingly, it didn't get licensed for the 24 to 30 36 weaker. It got licensed for the 32 to 36 weaker because I think there is this sort of uh, a fear of prematurity that, that sort of hangs over this program to some extent. And the thinking by the FDA, and I think it was the correct one, was let's limit this use then to the third trimester where if prematurity were a problem, it would be much less of a problem than, say, if the prematurity occurred in the second trimester. Uh, getting the vaccine in the third trimester is sufficient to have antibodies to pass on to the fetus, correct? Right. And so, so the, the, the typically um, antibodies are actually actively transported across the placenta starting at around 32 weeks gestation. And the recommendation was not only to, to give this vaccine, but to give it um, between sort of September and January as that 32 to 36 week gestation. So then you will transfer those antibodies uh, during the peak of the uh, winter respiratory syncytial virus season. So what, do we understand why a vaccine would cause premature births? Yeah, so so let's talk about this because I think that this this is an issue. So GlaxoSmithKline also made an RSV vaccine for pregnant people, and they did it by taking 120 micrograms of pre-F protein, pre-fusion protein, and giving it between 24 and 36 weeks gestation. So it's an identical product given basically in an identical manner. Now, the study that GSK did was, was not a 7,000-person study. It was roughly a 5,000-person study, and it was two-to-one vaccine to placebo. And they saw prematurity as a problem, as a statistically significant problem. Now, it was interesting that when they, they sort of looked uh, at uh, they sort of looked at various subsets, uh, 
debts. They found that this was an issue in low and middle income countries, mm. but not high income countries. So it wasn't a statistically significant observation at all in high income countries. And when you low it, it looked at low and middle income countries and you did further substratification to say, let's just look at people who either got this vaccine or didn't get this vaccine and didn't get any other vaccines other than that. And when they did that, there was not a statistically significant in, in increase. But then they said, well, let's look at people who may have gotten other vaccines, like the COVID vaccine or the flu vaccine. And those infections can also increase the risk of prematurity. And when they did that, that's when they saw the increased risk of prematurity. So so the other thing that was interesting is if you look at their 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 uh, their um, presentation, which was done in Lisbon, Portugal, about a month before the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee met in May, what you found was that it wasn't really so much that there was an increase in the uh, in the vaccine group in prematurity as there was a decrease in the placebo group. You see this sort of U-shaped curve for the placebo group, mm -hmm. suggesting that the placebo group had a lesser instance, not that the vaccine group had a greater instance. So therefore, that became statistically significant. Nonetheless, that was enough for GSK to kill their program, kill a program really that was identical to the program by, by Pfizer. So, so one of two things is true. I think when you have two identical programs and one company basically kills its product, which isn't done lightly because of an issue of prematurity, either one of two things is true. Either neither of them had a problem and GSK killed its program prematurely, prematurely which is possible, or, or they both have a problem. And, and Pfizer just hasn't seen it yet. Now, the, the thing about Pfizer's program is that for the, for the, if you look at the 24 to 36 week period of time, there were 33 excess cases of prematurity in the, in the vaccine group versus the placebo group, which, which um, was increased, but was not a statistically significant increase. Similarly, if you look just at the 32 to 36 week, there were nine excess cases. Again, more, but not statistically significant. So one question that I think one can reasonably ask is, is this biological? Logically plausible. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer to that question is it is. I mean, the, the RSV fusion protein is a toll like receptor for agonists, or said another way, it's, it can increase innate immunity. And the sort of the, all the sort of chemokines and, and, and uh, cytokines that are associated with innate immunity. So, so is it true then that a TLR4 agonist can increase the risk of prematurity? Yes, and there are studies certainly saying that. And then, in addition, are there studies showing that if you decrease sort of TLR4 stimulation or, have, or said another way, have TLR4 agonists, does that decrease the risk of prematurity? Yes. So I think this is biologically plausible. Um, and I think we need to make sure that we have in place, and we do have that, um, you know, the, the kind of systems that will very quickly determine whether or not this is an issue. And so you explained in the post that post-licensure studies are going to be important to determine if this is a clinically significant increase in prematurity, correct? Right. And that's the, the beauty, I think, of these kinds of systems. Something like the Vaccine Safety Data Link, which is this linked computerized medical record system that involves about 4% of the population in the United States. Um, you very quickly will be able to tell who's gotten this vaccine, who, who hasn't, and to see whether or not there is an issue of prematurity now in this in this third trimester. So what do you tell parents who are trying to decide uh, whether to take the risk of prematurity or not get vaccinated? Is there something else they can do? Well, so there is this monoclonal antibody, mm -hmm. um, which is given as a single intramuscular ingest injection, about four 0.5 mLs given before the winter season, this so-called nirsevimab or Bayfortis, which is also effective and arguably equally effective in this sort of, you know, 80% effective at preventing uh, serious respiratory syncytial virus infection. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages. So, so the, the, the disadvantage of a monoclonal antibody, as we've saw with, with uh, COVID, is that, that because it's, it's just uh, a, the product essentially of one B-cell clone, it is possible then that the virus can evolve away from that recognition by that one, that monoclonal antibody. On the other hand, when you give the whole protein, which is, is done for in the, the maternal vaccine, that induces a polyclonal response. So that is a, a value. But however, there is another advantage of nirsevimab, which is it can be given right before 
the uh, RSV season, whereas, you know, one isn't going to time their pregnancy that way. So, um, you know, there you may, you know, deliver your baby, say, in February, and then that's well before the RSV season, was when the RSV season is ending, and by the time your child is older um, is when the RSV season begins. But um, so th- there's, there's, there's um, pluses and minuses on both sides. So how do you think this will play out? Do you think the publicity will uh, discourage a number of uh, mothers from from pregnant people from getting uh, this vaccine? Um, I don't know. I I do. I certainly hope, as we all hope, that this um, this issue of prematurity will go away when we do these large uh, uh, studies, Mm -hmm. seeing whether or not this is an issue now, instead of looking at a few thousand people, but looking at tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. That's the hope. And I hope it goes away because the pregnancy platform is already somewhat crowded. I mean, you you get a Tdap vaccine, you get an influenza vaccine, you get a COVID vaccine, and this is now the fourth vaccine. And and parents are generally um, not great about getting uh, Mm -hmm. vaccines or mothers during pregnancy. I mean, there's there's uh, the uptake is actually 50 percent, 60 percent. It's a fragile platform. And I think one of the reasons it's a flash a fragile platform is when whenever you're asking a mother to vaccinate her, her, herself um, to protect both herself and her baby or on, although in the case of RSV, you're really preventing protecting the baby actually more than you're protecting yourself. Um, when you, you ask that, I think mothers instantly think of one thing when you're asking them to inject themselves with these biological agents, could this hurt my baby? And, and I think um, if it comes to be that this is a, a an uncommon or rare risk of prematurity, I think that will uh, uh, shake at some level this fragile platform. I think this also illustrates the limitations of clinical trials in terms of being able to pick up a rare side effect and the need for post licensure monitoring, correct? You're right. I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to work at, with, with a team at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that uh, created the rotavirus vaccine. The first rotavirus vaccine introduced in 1998 was found to be a rare cause of intussusception, which is intestinal blockage. The study that was done, the phase three study that was done by Wyeth in collaboration with NIH researchers, was roughly a 10,000 person study, which wasn't big enough to pick up this rare adverse event. And so the next two vaccines then, both Rotatec and, and Rotarix, those studies were roughly 70,000, which were, were huge. Those are huge and very expensive studies. And even that can rule out what I would argue is a relatively uncommon side effect, but it doesn't rule out a rare side effect. I mean, I, Maurice Hilleman, who I consider in many ways to be the father of modern vaccines, said it best, quote, I never breathe a sigh of relief until the first three million doses are out there. And I think mm-hmm. that's that's still true, but that's not something that's going to be picked up post-licensure. Uh, I'm sorry, pre-licensure. That's only sure. going to be something that's picked up post-licensure. I mean, with the COVID vaccines, the myocarditis, the blood clots, they were not picked up until post-licensure, right? Right, because they were rare, because there was yeah. one in 50,000 for, say, the mRNA vaccines or one in 200,000 for the J&J vaccine regarding clotting. You're not going to pick that up uh, pre-licensure. But the good news in this country is we do have systems in place to pick it up and pick it up quickly. Yeah, I think in this case, it shows the FDA is is concerned and they adjusted the the timing of vaccination to address that concern. And so people should get some confidence from that. I think that's exactly right. I think the FDA made exactly the right decision by limiting this to to third trimester use because that allowed them to, in a sense, jump with the net. Have I I covered everything, Paul? Yeah, I think we, we got it. All right. I'll put a link to the original post in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. 